Okay, let's kick off. So welcome to um, IB Europe's Industry Insider webinar with TikTok today. Um, my name is Marie-Claire Puffett. I'm the Marketing and Insights Director here at IB Europe, and I'm going to be your host for today. Um, and for those of you that don't know or haven't joined one of these um, sessions before, Industry Insider is a webinar format that we um, provide and host to share learnings and um, insights from industry leading companies from across um, the digital advertising ecosystem. And today we're very privileged to be joined by uh, TikTok and, um, and some industry experts who are going to explore how the end of third party cookies are reshaping dig the digital marketing landscape. So our speakers are going to delve into how businesses from across the ecosystem are firstly gearing up for this transformation um, and, and how ready they are. Um, and TikTok's going to provide insight into the solutions marketers need to, dry, uh, to thrive in this um, evolving landscape. So um, we'll, we'll kick off with Ksenia Barton from TikTok um, by taking us on a journey from cookies to connections. Um, but before I hand over to Ksenia, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so this is a live event. Um, and we do encourage you to ask questions of our speakers. So if you have speakers, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom interface um, and uh, we'll be monitoring those there. Um, we are also recording the webinar um, and it will be shared with all of you after the session. So I am now going to um, hand over to Ksenia, um, who is Performance Marketing Lead at TikTok. Um, and as I said, she's going to take us on a cookies to connections journey. So um, welcome to Ksenia and over to you. Thank you, Mary Claire. Um, I will share my uh, presentation right now. Um, just one second. Okay, I hope uh, you can see it. Marika, can you confirm that uh, it's all visible? And you yep, can see we can it. see it looks good. Thank you. Fantastic. Great. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so while Q4 is typically known for its Black Friday and holiday shopping uh, frenzy, it's also a time for reflection and planning for the future ahead. So as we approach the new year, we are stepping into a particularly interesting periods of time filled with significant changes in our industry. So today we assembled an incredible panel uh, to dive into how businesses are gearing up and strategizing for the era post third party cookies. But before we jump into uh, this crucial uh, discussion, let's take a quick trip to the world of TikTok and it's quite an exciting one. So we'll explore how TikTok can be your compass through these changes helping drive your performance objectives and ensuring you are making the most uh, of available uh, solutions. Um, so just uh, uh, to see where we are going and how big changes uh, we are going uh, to face, what we see right now that more and more people are asking for the control. Uh, with increased uh, usage of ad blockers uh, and uh, uh, yours uh, users uh, are uh, actually like uh, applying more and more uh, privacy uh, settings, uh, uh, people are asking for more control. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a response uh, to it, governments are really assigning uh, into new laws and regulations and policies protecting user uh, data. We know about GDPR and the DSA. And as a response uh, to that, uh, also a lot of operating uh, system and browsers, including uh, Apple, Mozilla, and Google, are implementing changes limiting data tracking and collection. And uh, we all know that uh, like uh, it's uh, been coming for quite some time and it uh, maybe became a bit of like the uh, industry <laughs> a joke that, uh, but Google is confirming uh, us that uh, actually next year, uh, third party cookies uh, will disappear from uh, Google uh, Chrome uh, browsers. And uh, um, that it's uh, disappearing from 1% uh, this year to 100% uh, uh, next uh, year. 
So uh, with all of these changes, actually being really on the doorstep uh, of uh, like our uh, world, we still see, and that's a very fresh uh, research from this year, that 75% of marketers still rely heavily on third-party cookies. But at the same time, we also see that 50% of potential market of that marketers, uh, they are already is in the cookie-less environment. And that's because of the ad blockers uh, and um, uh, Apple uh, users uh, as well. And we've implemented uh, changes uh, by uh, Google, and we know that uh, Google owns uh, around 65% uh, of uh, all the uh, browser market uh, share, that that will be quite a big um, percentage. So with all of that, really the data lake relying on third-party cookies is melting quickly and impact on digital effectiveness is big and going to be big. It's going to affect uh, how we are targeting our audience, how we know who they are, where they are, what they do, what they like to do. And that will affect uh, as well as delivering the relevant uh, messages to them. If we don't know who they are, what they like, we won't be able to actually deliver the right advertising to them. But also it will affect the measuring outcomes and us measuring effectiveness um, uh, in, a, in a correct uh, and a meaningful uh, way. But uh, where challenges, there are opportunities. And uh, for quite some time, because it's been coming for uh, already uh, some time, uh, a lot of industry leaders uh, and organizations and consultancies been developing uh, strategies and recommendations uh, how to gain a competitive advantage. And uh, one uh, example uh, is a McKinsey recommendation uh, around uh, how businesses can navigate around uh, in the cookie-less uh, world. So the first um, direction was around first-party data uh, and uh, uh, encouraging businesses really uh, to using their own consumer touch points to collect first party data. The second uh, uh, direction is uh, about increased use of contextual and uh, interest-based uh, advertising where um, targeting and strategies are based on the content users are viewing and their recent top categories of interest. And the third one, uh, is uh, leveraging second party data through social platforms. And uh, um, consultancies like McKinsey, Accenture, Deloitte, they love to use the term for social platforms as the world gardens, uh, <clears throat> the world gardens ecosystems, uh, where marketers can leverage your first party data from uh, that uh, platforms as their second uh, party data. And that's exactly uh, what uh, I uh, wanted uh, to uh, discuss and um, today with you how TikTok can be your bridge over troubled uh, water. But nothing can um, speak uh, better uh, for that than the TikTok. But in order to do it, I just like will reshare my screen because I, I just want to make sure that um, uh, that the audio uh, is uh, going uh, to play um, in the best way. Um, just give me a second. Sorry for that. Yes. Sorry for <laughs> a bit of <clears throat> a bump. Uh, I hope you can uh, hear it. Around, every now and then I get a little bit terrified and then I see the look in your eyes. Turn around, bite eyes. Every now and then I fall apart. And I need you now tonight. And I need you more than ever. So really, TikTok uh, can be the way uh, for you to still uh, be effective and drive your performance uh, uh, in the area of uh, cookie-less uh, advertising. 
Uh, and uh, uh, so how you can ensure your success today and the future with a TikTok. And uh, we have got uh, uh, already like established solutions uh, and uh, uh, safe and reliable data connection to make sure you keep driving your effectiveness. Uh, so data connections is laying in the middle of this uh, with safe and reliable data connection, which we already established with a recommended uh, setup, you will be able uh, to uh, actually target people who express specific interest in your product. We know uh, what they like, uh, what their buying behavior being, so you can communicate effectively uh, on our uh, platform uh, with uh, them. Uh, also, we already developed and tested uh, our uh, core performance uh, solutions uh, from uh, like driving all of your performance objectives from uh, traffic, uh, to app installs and of course conversions. And also we have got uh, uh, solutions which will help uh, you to get their uh, first uh, party data and uh, uh, also uh, a product uh, which can help you with contextual uh, targeting as well. And of course, the better our data connection integration uh, with you, the more advanced um, products and solutions uh, you can uh, leverage. Uh, also, we know that uh, uh, the disappearance uh, of third-party cookies and us moving to the privacy-first uh, world is going to affect how we are going to measure solutions. With a lot of people being more and more disappointed uh, uh, with the last uh, click uh, uh, attribution, so we see the importance of measuring success and effectiveness holistically. Uh, and so we have got uh, an amazing uh, uh, solutions and uh, suites uh, of measurement uh, uh, tools uh, to actually uh, to uh, see uh, this um, holistically. And uh, of course, uh, uh, it's important to constantly optimize and uh, test uh, to make sure you're driving effectiveness. But uh, for uh, the rest uh, of uh, uh, time, I just really wanted to focus a bit more on what lies in the middle and it's the heart uh, of the effectiveness uh, on uh, uh, TikTok. It's data connections. So data connections are essential to deliver high performance uh, ads. It's like your GPS navigator and North Star to ensure effectiveness uh, of uh, your performance campaigns. Uh, right now, when we still have got uh, third party cookies, we still have got Pixel, uh, we do recommend uh, to uh, have got a dual setup using Pixel and events API for uh, companies and businesses who already uh, operating with us with this recommended setup, we see an increase in effectiveness with the 19% uh, increase in incremental events and 15% improvement on CPA. But when the, uh, we are entering the cookie-less world, uh, it will be so crucial for us to uh, rely on the events API, the server-to-server -server connection uh, to navigate uh, through this uh, cookie world. Uh, we already have got a, a big number of clients who implemented the safe and reliable data connection with us and saw an increase uh, in uh, effectiveness. So one of our clients, the Essence World, uh, saw the 98% increase in complete payment events, 18% increase in ROAS, and 15% reduction uh, in CPA. And this data was validated by our attribution partner, uh, Phosphor. And that's one of the example. And we have got more clients uh, who are demonstrating a bigger effect for us just because like we know more insights, we know what these people are liking and we managed to deliver them the right uh, message. Why it's important? Because it's really helping us uh, with uh, improved measurements. Uh, because measuring campaign uh, performance and ROAS um, with is based on insights, combining this consumer journey and the user experience on TikTok. The more we know what they like, what uh, their insights are, we can actually deliver uh, more effective um, messages. Uh, so, and also it unlocks uh, the more advanced uh, solutions. Uh, so uh, I've been saying that the better our established data connections, the actually the more sophisticated uh, solutions uh, you can use uh, on TikTok, including uh, video shopping ads, value-based optimization, and smart performance campaigns, which recommended themselves as a Ferrari in the TikTok uh, performance uh, uh, solutions uh, products. Uh, and also, uh, we know that uh, uh, 
when we are entering the privacy and uh, first of all, so, uh, privacy is becoming and data, data privacy is becoming a crucial uh, and it's becoming in the center of everything. And it's very important uh, for us uh, as well. And we really working hard and we want to ensure you that this uh, data connections are safe and reliable with the advertisers being in the control. Uh, so try to establish a data connection with TikTok. Advertisers uh, provide uh, users a notice regarding how their data is used and obtain their consent. Uh, and uh, also uh, <clears throat> later with Events API, advertisers can choose which data uh, you want uh, to share uh, with us uh, and um, also in accordance with industry standards, match keys shared with TikTok are encrypted prior to a transmission. So all of these practices are really in accordance with industry standards and ensuring the, that it's uh, uh, safe uh, and uh, reliable for both uh, between us and between uh, users and you. And we know how implementing events API can be difficult. Uh, and uh, when you're thinking about where to do the uh, where to spend your developers uh, uh, time. Sometimes event CPI, it's not the uh, most uh, important priority uh, for you. And uh, that's why we've got you. We know how important it is. And we know that uh, uh, you're sometimes struggling uh, with uh, resources uh, uh, to establish this server-to-server -server connection. So that's why we offer support in smooth integration to get this recommended setup with onboarded external consultancy and development partners across uh, the Europe. So please reach out to your TikTok representative uh, to request uh, this uh, support. Um, so really what uh, I wanted to say uh, then, so where the challenges there are opportunities. And one common misconception is that per personalization is at odds with privacy. However, that is not the case. In fact, many of the solutions uh, evolving today are actually helping to create a more private world with consumers at the center of decision-making and establishing a true connections with your audience. So Really, we are in the middle of this exciting shift, not only from cookies to data connections, but also to uh, people uh, connections. So we are here at TikTok are very excited about upcoming uh, future uh, because uh, this is our chance to actually connect meaningfully and put our audience truly uh, first. Um, and uh, so now I really wanted to invite uh, our amazing uh, panel uh, to discuss uh, how their businesses are prepared for this upcoming uh, changes and which opportunities uh, they see overall um, while entering uh, this uh, space. Um, and so I have got uh, here with me this amazing like panel. Um, we have got uh, Jazz Deep uh, Mande from uh, uh, Performix at Stockholm, uh, Jazz is head of demand uh, generation. We also have got uh, Elton uh, Olerhert uh, from uh, ACES Media Group. Um, uh, Elton is a director uh, there. Um, and uh, we have got Laura uh, Carstens, uh, director of product marketing at uh, IAS. Um, so I'm super helpful to discuss uh, uh, with you what uh, is uh, how are you guys like preparing for all of these changes and uh, is it uh, scary or actually is it uh, as exciting as probably as uh, for me uh, of course digital world is uh, keep surprising us uh, always uh, uh, so uh, maybe we'll start with a question how you and your businesses uh, are prepared for this deprecation of third-party cookies and which strategies are you developing right now to navigate these uh, changes? Uh, Jess, um, can we start uh, with uh, what you're doing at Performix uh, at Stalcom? Um, yeah, absolutely. Ksenia, you're so right, actually. It is actually quite exciting, isn't it? It's actually an opportunity to focus on creativity to get around the problems that are being presented to us in the industry. So at Performix and within Publicis Group, we've developed a cookie-less impact assessment, which is um, an assessment we run on all of our clients' businesses to assess the level of risk for each campaign, each strategy that we're running. So is there an, is there a potential risk of reliance on third-party cookies at any part of the funnel on any platforms that we're running across? And this enables us to identify those risk factors and start to mitigate them through testing and deployment of other strategies. 
And so what, what do you see when you are assessing like how your clients are already like ready and in which uh, state of uh, um, the readiness they are? There are widely different states of readiness. And I think it depends on what their client goals and the types of strategies that they're already running. If a business is already um, using a lot of, as you said before, walled garden type uh, media activities, they tend to be better prepared. And where we have businesses running more across um, other types of digital media that are more reliant on third party cookies, um, mitigation strategies need to be deployed now so that we can understand what will be um, the right strategy to use come the end of 2024. Thank you, Jess. And uh, Elton, uh, what, uh, what is happening? Uh, how are you prepared at ASUS Media Group for that? So it's exciting opportunity for you guys as well. <laughs> it is, yeah. Thanks, Benia. Um, it's good to be here. So I'm, I'm representing ASOS on, on kind of two different um, bases. One one will be the traditional, you know, the ASOS as the advertiser, because we, we obviously invest the TikTok and a number of other social media platforms and um, digital um, publishers and so on. Um, that, is, that is not my direct remit, but I'm going to give you some perspective on that from ASOS. And then, of course, um, uh, ASOS as a retail media network, which is my specific remit. I can also give you a few thoughts on that. So from ASOS as an advertiser and as a retail media network, I think there's there's a large focus on, um, you know, the first party customer data. So w whether we are going to harness that internally or use it externally, it's it's very important for us to make sure that there is a massive focus on our, our own first party data, um, you know, consent mechanisms uh, have to be re-looked at. We've got a, a consent ma uh, management platform in place with OneTrust, and we're kind of going through that process at the moment. You know, the final hurdles of just making sure that we've we've got everything, <clears throat> excuse me, ready and aligned for next year. Um, you know, close eye on making sure there's there's compliance and we're upgrading consent. So, you know, it, it's great for the industry because it's it's very good for the customer. You know, the the end user is protected and going to be more so going forward. And um, retailers are very focused on customer experience, as you can imagine. So we, we really need to make sure that's protected. So consent and that and that side of things with first party data is, is a massive um, focus for us. Uh, from an advertiser perspective, ASOS is also making sure we've got the server to server um, uh, kind of integrations in place with the various media owners and social platforms, which will help. Um, just to make sure that we're very organized. We're also working um, with Google to make sure that we've got a tag manager in place to make sure that, you know, that can enable uh, compliance from a CMP perspective. So it's it's quite a lot of uh, checks and balances underway. And then, um, you know, obviously we're looking at uh, how can we use those connections that we make. We're also investigating um, you know, contextual targeting opportunities for next year. And then on the flip side, um, ASOS as a retail media network, you know, we're thinking kind of how can we help marketers from, from our brands, so the, the endemic brands who sell their products on ASOS, they're interested in, in marketing those products to the ASOS customer. So it's also, again, very much first-party data focus, make sure we've got the right consent, make sure we can target those customers effectively um, using the first party data and just making sure we've got our, the, the, you know, the ad tech solutions for targeting and measurement in place. And, and of course, the, there are these changes underway make, uh, make it a little bit more complicated. So there's, there's work to be done on that front um, as well. Thank you, Alton. Yeah, it's a lot of exciting opportunities, especially with retail uh, media uh, network. Uh, it's uh, probably will be a big boom uh, of that, and a lot of advertisers uh, will find amazing opportunities uh, with that. And um, Laura, uh, what's uh, like? I know that uh, IS are uh, developing amazing tools uh, now as well. And uh, so, tell us a bit like more. Uh, what uh, uh, are you doing uh, to be prepared and to get prepared? 
Perfect. Yes, definitely. So um, just for, for background, so IS is a global media measurement and optimization platform for advertisers, publishers, and media, uh, media partners. And we work closely with um, partners like TikTok to create solutions for advertisers. Um, IS as a company um, does not rely on cookies, which is, you know, great in terms of how we're preparing for, for this change next year. So we have various tools across the open web, social, CTV, and more that allow our advertisers um, to opt optimize and measure um, while respecting that user privacy that's so important. Um, so IS has been, kind of been preparing for this by, you know, creating and developing sophisticated AI driven tools that really focus on allowing advertisers to reach the right audience and either, you know, a lot of was mentioned was contextual. So either contextually safe or contextual brand safe, suitable um, environments, also measuring where they are running, um, understanding engagement um, and understanding how they're engaging with real users. Um, again, all while respecting that consumer privacy, that's, that's so important. Oh, that's super interesting. Tell us a bit more about the AI uh, tool which uh, you're developing and how it's uh, helping advertisers uh, to uh, reach uh, the uh, the relevant uh, audience. And uh, uh, just it uh, sounds really interesting. And I saw it's been featured in the performance marketing uh, world as well, I think, as the technology uh, of the month. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. So yeah, so we we have a couple different ones. So one is um, for open web is our context control solution. So this allows advertisers to target and avoid uh, based off of the contextual relevance of that, that web page. So understanding things like emotion. So, you know, what's the difference between joy and love versus sadness and hate? Um, and then understanding semantics. So is it a positive article? Is it negative? And then all this is powered by a natural language processing tool. So really reading these web pages like, like they're human. So again, versus using a third-party cookie data, this is really just understanding what is that contextual relevance of that uh, web page um, to allow advertisers to target or avoid content that's aligned with their brand goals. Um, with TikTok specifically, and on the kind of um, the, the social side, we also offer brand safety and suitability measurements. So allowing advertisers to really understand the context in which they appear. So on TikTok specifically, you know, we look at the video um, before and after an ad would be placed and really understand by, you know, the frame level, um, understanding if what this is, um, you know, aligned to in, in regards to the GARM framework. So that's a wonderful tool, again, for advertisers to really understand where they're, uh, you know, appearing on, on different um, platforms. Um, and then there's a great case study we can talk about too later on, but, um, you know, working with uh, TikTok as well on brand safety targeting. So again, focusing on different metrics now that third-party cookies uh, are being deprecated and, and using that, those brand safety and suitability signals for advertisers. Oh, that's that's fascinating. And we've been chatting about contextual uh, advertising uh, like uh, before, and it's also like with Jazz uh, on the, uh, our uh, catch up because like contextual targeting is so like more like well known uh, for the upper funnel for the branding uh, like uh, opportunities, but uh, uh, actually. Is it like should it be like? Do you see the potential of contextual uh, uh, advertising uh, for to drive performance objectives? Uh, just uh, uh, I know there are a lot of like different opinions, uh, uh, but uh, maybe uh, like uh, uh, while we are in the area of discussing contextual uh, advertising as one of the strategy, Jess, what's your opinion? Like as the uh, you're focusing on the performance um, at uh, like Stockholm with the uh, performance being like very performance. Uh, driven uh, part uh, of this uh, like media empire. Uh, so uh, what's uh, uh, your thoughts on the contextual targeting for the performance objectives? I think contextual targeting is obviously something that as, as both yourself, Kasani and Laura have both said is something that we are now turning to with the um, with, with the de uh, deprecation of cookies rather than one-to-one -one targeting, which is largely based on third-party cookies. We're going to be targeting many people. I think that's a bit of a barrier that we need to overcome, this concern about moving from very personalized one-to-one -one targeting, which is reliant on third-party cookies, um, towards maybe more contextual targeting. There are so many opportunities for success with good contextual targeting, and I think the industry has come so far since contextual targeting was a thing a couple of years ago. I think actually we're in a place now where contextual targeting is extremely strong um, and has the ability to deliver on performance KPIs as well as upper funnel KPIs. 
um, especially as contextual, um, new contextual strategies are being released by a lot of media owners now in preparation for cookie deprecation. Thank you so much, uh, Elton. You've also been uh, mentioning contextual. Uh, is it something what uh, you are planning to use uh, actually while planning um, like uh, campaigns uh, for performance? Yeah, I think so. I mean, from from our point of view, we we do invest a, a lot of our advertising budget in performance, and um, it's something that we've probably been over indexing on over the past two or three years. We are this year actually starting to, to invest um, a, a higher proportion of our marketing budget in more upper funnel objectives like brand positioning, repositioning the ASOS brand and kind of giving a um, bit more context around that. But with regards to the contextual advertising question, um, yeah, for sure. I, I mean, I, I think it's definitely a full funnel opportunity and, um, you know, context is really important in terms of, um, identifying user intent. So, you know, what people are interested in, but also what they're in market for. So I do feel that it's it's definitely a full funnel option for sure. Yeah, dependent on what kind of creatives and, and, and ads you're actually using. Uh, and so, thank you so much, Elton. Yeah, uh, uh, it's uh, interesting like to try, but uh, yeah, I think a lot of people are quite uh, cautious. Laura, what's your opinion uh, on that one? Yeah, so um, as noted, you know, IS has been working in contextual targeting and avoidance um, for some time now, and we've seen great success. So we we did have a case study where we worked with a programmatic agency um, on running on contextual um, context control segments um, for for targeting. So really curating it to what they were looking to to target. And in terms of metrics and upper funnel and performance, they saw a twenty one percent increase in click through rate, ten percent increase in completion rate of those that campaign. Um, and then a 36% improvement in cost per click. So I think there are strong, you know, studies and, and research going into to showing how effective context can be um, in terms of, of that targeting and avoidance for campaigns. Thank you so much. Um, no, we already like uh, covered the contextual uh, opportunity, but that's uh, one of the many. Uh, so if we kind of like step away from how, like from our businesses, like and uh, uh, our companies and thinking about like wider opportunities, um, like what uh, uh, businesses uh, uh, can leverage uh, for in future, uh, actually, when we are really entering the privacy uh, first like uh, world, what else you think like is uh, we all have to start thinking of like which strategies which products which solutions uh, so um, maybe we'll start with Elton uh, uh, right now like uh, if like step away from ACES and what you guys like doing what's uh, what is the ideal like uh, scenarios and strategies for businesses like to leverage in general yeah, I mean, I think the, the the first party data is the obvious one. You know, you have to ensure you've got a very robust first party data strategy. Um, I think also the measurement is an interesting one. You, you need to be looking at measurement tools that are not reliant on cookies. So um, marketing mix modeling or geo testing um, are really important to explore. And, and also because attribution will be impacted I need to explore other models. So first touch, last touch, multi-touch attribution. Um, and then and probably finally looking at um, long-term metrics of channel success, things like um, lifetime value of customers. So, you know, a few different components right the way through from the targeting through to the measurement would be really important to consider and plan for. Yeah. And uh, thinking about the first uh, party data, that's... Uh... Like that was actually the hardest, and I think it's still like the hardest like data to get. Um, like uh, in your like experience, and what are your recommendations? How advertisers like marketers can actually? What are the best strategies for them to start uh, actually uh, getting this uh, first party data? Yeah. So for a, for a company like ASOS, who is a retailer with a big uh, first party database um, ourselves it, 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 it I think that's probably a really big benefit you know not all companies are able to collect and build their own first party databases so if you are it's certainly um, uh, a continued and probably increased priority 
if you do not have a big first party database, it's probably worth exploring how you can possibly do that. Um, and, and are there any partnership opportunities that will help you do that? So I would say that's kind of a crucial and critical element. Um, as I mentioned at the start of the discussion, you know, making sure you've got the right consent is really important so that you've got a very strong, clean um, first party database that's that's opted in for whatever you might choose to to use that for. Um, and of course, the the customer experience and how you treat the customer and the consumer is really should be the first consideration should it should be about their own their privacy, how you treat their data, and how you plan to use that, ideally for their own benefit. Um, so at ASOS, we'll be, you know, we'll be collecting um, customer data on a consented basis, on the basis that we can provide the right, um, you know, content to them, whether that's putting together a, a certain look that might be appropriate based on their interests, their their behavior in terms of what they look for on ASOS, what they shop for, what they add to their wish list and so on. So it's an internal use case. But then also if we are um, looking to kind of hash that and, and uh, then match that in a, in a pseudonymized, non-identifiable way with um, the media partners that we, we work with, like TikTok and others, um, you know, it's really important that we've got that database as uh, clean and as large and accurate as possible, so that we can utilize that and leverage it um, with other media owners. Uh, thank you, uh, Alton, of that. And uh, Laura, what uh, uh, do you see as the wider also like opportunities? And uh, uh, also, maybe I saw you nodding on the first party data like importance. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, what do you see as the wider opportunities? Yeah, definitely. So, just building on what Alton had said, I think that. Um, I think the biggest opportunity we have right now is time. So we, you know, this isn't a new kind of thing that's been happening. Um, we know it's coming. So I think that for advertisers, the biggest opportunity really is to use this time to test and then also revisit their KPIs, as Elton was saying. So I think, you know, either shifting to either new solutions or trying new products or mediums or platforms um, that might not be in your marketing strategy right now and really becoming comfortable with them and really starting to shift your strategy so that when these, the third party deprecation does happen, there are no surprises, your performance is not impacted. I think that's a really exciting opportunity that, again, there is time um, to test out new strategies. Um, and then similar to what Alton was saying as well, I think revisiting the KPIs is really important. So um, kind of thinking to yourself as a, as a brand, what's important to you and how can I measure that effectively? Um, I think there's been a status quo of a lot of metrics we've gotten from having cookies. Um, so really being able to revisit, you know, what does a strong performance look like, again, for your brand specifically? will be important um, as we kind of, you know, shift in terms of the landscape of data we're getting and all of that. So I would say, you know, it, yes, asking yourself, what do I want to see as a brand and then have a plan in place um, to measure that effectively is a great opportunity um, as we gear up for, for the deprecation. Thank you so much, uh, Laura. And Jess, uh, what, what are your thoughts on the wider like opportunities which businesses can uh, leverage? Yeah, so I think actually touching on what Elton was mentioning earlier about first party data and for businesses that maybe don't have a lot of first party data, there's definitely a strong trend at the moment towards finding methods of accruing that data, whether that's through um, promoting newsletter signups or finding ways to capture the data of your customers or audiences who might be engaging with you. And I actually think um, also from Elton's world, like retail media is a big opportunity in this space too, since businesses who don't own their own first party data can partner with or, or make take advantage of retail media networks to utilize their own first party data as well. Just just to add on that quickly, Jasdeep, um, that, I think that's a really important point. And building your own database is if, if you don't have a, a you know substantial or uh, a database presently, it's you know that customer trust element is so crucial because um, you know consumers are, are <laughs> whichever site you go to, they want you to sign up to something. So I think it's really important that there is a good value exchange, and also there is the the trust developed between the publisher or the retailer and and the consumer or customer. So, you know, you, you really need to offer a, a good value exchange 
so that whatever they're signing up to, you know, it's not some kind of spam. So I think that whole user experience focus is really important from advertisers, marketers, media owners. Um, it, it's very important that if you're getting a customer or asking customers to sign up to something, um, you know, there is a, a transparency there. You can build trust and you can really offer them value. Otherwise, they're probably going to become skeptical, not not willing to sign up as well, which is, you know, not what anyone wants. And in your experience, like, uh, uh, like question to all of you, like, what can be the best? Like, uh, what can be something what we can offer to customers in uh, return to uh, providers like the first party data? Like, uh, what's been like uh, uh, the best practice in uh, that uh, area? Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, from my point of view, um, I'm thinking kind of of a, a consumer myself, but also as, you know, from, from an ASOS hat on. I, I just think that we, we need to make sure that we are valuing the customer and not abusing that consent. So, you know, there, there's been such a, a high kind of focus on unnecessary email, um, overly commercialized um opt-ins, whether it's, you know, e email, push notification or other kinds of targeting, even display ads, you know, it's, it, I think customers are quite skeptical of, of targeting and the, the bad actors in the industry have probably given everyone a bad name where, you know, we've probably all been subject to friends and family saying, oh, I went and shopped for something and then I got chased around the internet by the the ads, you know, these, uh, it's like they kind of group all the bad actors together with everyone else. So I just think the more we can all be focused on, you know, not overly commercializing everything um, and, and really focusing on the customer user experience, I think that's probably where media owners and retailers and owners of data who are able to target advertising and messaging will win because that's where the customer trust will will really kick in and, and you know those those brands who who are trusted you know that's really where customers will kind of keep returning to and that's where there's value and that's if we do it carefully and well uh, that's where we can kind of benefit from from a marketing perspective for sure yeah i would add you know um the value exchange as elton has said is so important you know providing exclusive content early access Sometimes actually is enough, but sometimes it's not as well. Um, I think loyalty programs are definitely something that we're seeing much more of in the industry now as a method to build up first party data, but to actually provide something meaningful back to your customers over a longer period of time to actually keep them engaged with your brand as well. Thank, thank you so much. And uh, I think we covered like uh, and contextual and first party data and uh, just really wanted like maybe for a few minutes, like uh, to think about opportunities leveraging second party data, uh, like uh, um, also like Jess, you're probably working a lot uh, with uh, social uh, media platforms. Like, are you considering, I know that I asked uh, like uh, Laura, you've been doing a lot of case studies, uh, maybe like uh, a bit of like opportunities which uh, can be leveraged um, uh, through the second party data. Uh, Jess, maybe we'll start. Yeah, uh... sure. I think um, we, we were talking earlier about contextual, as you said, and contextual seems to be overtaking personalized marketing, but actually in the space of walled garden, personalized marketing is still an opportunity due to the availability of that data on those platforms. Um, you know, overall, we, as you said in your presentation, Ksenia, wall gardens are going to be less impacted overall by the deprecation of third party cookies. There might be some audiences that start to decay, but probably not very significantly. And so because of that, the opportunity for personalization still exists in these wall gardens and why the wall gardens are such an important part of any media plan these days. Thank you so much, uh, Laura. Uh, what do you think is uh, um, can be leveraged? Yeah, so definitely agree with um agree, agree with everything um that's been said already. I think that yeah, there's an opportunity with um the wall gardens and you know partners like TikTok um to to focus on contextual and brand safety and suitability, especially. Um so um I asked TikTok and Clinique actually did a case study for brand awareness campaign for the black honey lipstick. Um and with the IS TikTok um brand safety solution. So this is targeting 
brand safe content within the, the TikTok feed. Um, Clinique was able to um, have over 4.25 million impressions um, on content that was scored as 97.67 um, for brand safety rate. So I think there are a lot of you know successes and a lot of uh, tools out there with, with these partners. Um, that's really encouraging to see. Um, so advertisers, you know, already are, you know, invested heavily on, on platforms like social and, and retail media, but I think it will continue to, to grow. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, yeah, Clinic uh, Honey <laughs> Black uh, lipstick became viral on TikTok. I actually wear it right now. So yeah, uh, it's <laughs> set a TikTok uh, trend. But no, it's incredible case study. Uh, but uh, Elton, uh, I know that's also like uh, uh, retail um, uh, media network is uh, probably going also to collaborate uh, like uh, a lot uh, with uh, uh, Walt Gardens ecosystem. Uh, so do you see opportunities uh, also in this kind of like partnership and collaboration and uh, um, between those yeah. two? So from, from a uh, retail media network point of view, um, ASOS has been very focused on our, you know, cleaning up the first party database along with our marketing team. In terms of kind of going forward. So, so we work with our non-endemic and endemic uh, brands. So non-endemics are the likes of the payment partners mainly. They don't sell their product necessarily on, on ASOS, but they we work with some payment partners, the likes of you know PayPal and Klarna and ClearPay and, and the rest of them. Um, but I think the, the, the big thing really is also working with data collaboration companies and setting up um, the ability to harness the first party data elsewhere. So that, that's not something we've we've done yet, but it's it's something we've got um, plans to do in the coming 12 months, which is to, how do we harness the first party data that we've got in the world, world garden of ASOS? Um, and um, I suppose enable both our endemic brand partners who sell their product on ASOS, to um, target those customers offsite, whether it's online or whether it's on CTV, that's something that we haven't offered yet. That's that's something that's coming, and we definitely want to offer that ability and that capability. And and also, um, you know, that can be for non-endemic brands as well, who we haven't really interacted with very much. And you know the. The Gen Z or 20-something fashion-loving audience can be quite appealing to a number of um, consumer electronics companies, streaming companies, um, fast last mile and food delivery companies. So there's a lot of options there of where those companies might be able to leverage um, our first party data in a way they haven't done so before. No, thank, thank you. Thank you for that, Elton. And previously, you also been mentioning there how uh, the measurement would be also like different. I think Laura also uh, been uh, mentioning. So I think, yeah, it will be affected massively. And uh, uh, what, uh, in your opinion, like uh, how we will be able to measure effectiveness uh, in the cookie list and privacy, uh, like uh, first uh, world, like Laura, maybe like, uh, what, what do you think <clears throat> where the future of measurement? Uh, um, like, it seems like we are going, what, like 15 uh, years uh, uh, ago when uh, we hadn't got like third party cookies, we hadn't got pixels. So it just like, it feels like, oh, like uh, we are there again. Uh, but um, uh, what, what's what's your opinion? What's the future of measurement? Or is it like the past is the future? Yeah, <laughs> hopefully not. I'm sure I feel like we're evolving. So I do think that, you know, using um, like cookie list measurement right now is is a great way to get started on measurement that will, again, um, stand the test of time as, as third party cookies deprecate. So I think that's the first step is using that cookie, li uh, cookie list based measurement. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, I think establishing what is your, the correct KPI for your brand. Um, again, in a post cookie world. So really becoming familiar of how, how are you going to measure success and what does success look like for your brand? And it's going to look different, of course, for, for every, you know, agencies and brands across the, the ecosystem. So I think that's one part of it. And then I think another, um, you know, part of the future of measurement is, of course, I think there's a big focus on attention. So I think attention will be big. I think, you know, looking at responsible media will be um, increasingly important. So I do think that there's um, shifts of measurement to see how successful you, you you know your campaigns are and you are as a brand. So I think that conversation definitely will continue to evolve next year um, and you know pass that as well. Uh, Jess, what what do you think? 
Yeah, so I think I um, totally agree with Laura about um, kind of the evolution of measurement. Most data about people and performance is becoming aggregated and it's becoming more limited and it's becoming less real time. A lot more of our data is modeled. We're becoming, we're becoming more familiar with that and we need to get comfortable with that kind of language that actually the data that we're relying on for like optimization, for planning, for reporting, a lot of it is more modeled because um, currently our planning and optimization is reliant on cookie-based data. We do a lot of our decision-making based on cookies, but actually we're going to be doing a lot of our decision-making um, based on more modeled data, modeled and aggregated data in the future. And we're going to need to find proxies, like more new proxies to business outcomes to understand which metrics better correlate with business outcomes in this new world um, without third party cookies. Elton, what, what, do, what do you think? Yeah, um, I think you'll probably see uh, data clean room usage escalating. So where people can kind of do a lot of analysis and, and put a lot of their campaign activity together to see um, what impact it's having. Um, cross device tracking using first party data rather than cookied solutions is is probably another one. Uh, and like Jazz and Laura have been kind of saying, I think we're, we're looking at advanced attribution and analytics models. Um, yeah, it's probably a lot lot there. The 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 kind of um, modeling is an interesting one. I'm not that familiar with it, but I think that's definitely an interesting one that we're going to see a lot more of. And so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting times, but um, we're going to have to find new ways to, to measure our campaigns. Uh, thank you so, so much. Um, and uh, I think we have got like eight minutes uh, to tackle questions uh, from uh, our uh, audiences. Um, and uh, I'm passing uh, back to Mary Claire, but really, really uh, thank you for such an interesting uh, discussion. And so we really hope uh, that uh, our audience will find uh, a lot of uh, strategies and insights uh, and uh, well, which will be actionable and applicable uh, for their businesses. So uh, back to Mary Claire. Thank you, Ksenia, and thank you, Elton, Nora, and Jazz. I think that was a super insightful discussion. Um, I think, to be fair, you've covered a lot of ground there and answered an awful lot of questions. Um, but I just had one question that came through. Um, you talked a bit, you all kind of referred to in the discussion a little bit about um, using metrics and KPIs um, that can be used without third-party cookies. And I was just curious if there were kind of a, a couple of examples that you might be able to give if, if you've seen any brands, you know, already using KPIs or metrics that, that don't rely on third party cookies, what do they look like and and how can how can brands think about those? I'm just going to open the floor to anyone who might might be able to share anything on that. I think as Laura was just saying, attention and viewability metrics are definitely something that um, can be used in the absence of third party cookies as a method of understanding um, like ad performance. Um, and I think that doesn't override the importance of conversion metrics, but I think it, it helps build that picture of what's what contributing to those conversions and could become interesting proxies in the future as we experience data loss as a result of cookie deprecation. Agreed. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Alton. <laughs> sorry, Laura. <laughs> yeah, and I'm just gonna say from from um, you know, if we are um the retail media network working with brands on or reaching ASOS's audiences, you know, it's, it's our first party data. So we we can look at, um, you know, some of the, the traditional metrics like return on ad spend, um, you know, new to brand, lifetime customer value. So that, that's something the world gardens are able to do. Um, so I think you, you'll still see a, a lot of reliance on that. Yeah, I totally agree from like um, our side, like on TikTok uh, through uh, our uh, TikTok ads manager and like working with attribution partners, you will be able to see also traditional metrics uh, like of uh, uh, traffic, of conversion, on return uh, of uh, investment. But I think uh, it's uh, um, Laura also like and Jess uh, mentioned like viewability. And I think it will be very important, like uh, not rely only on the last click, uh, but also like to have got uh, uh, the uh, view uh, through uh, 
uh, attribution, uh, especially for the video platforms uh, like uh, uh, TikTok. And I think uh, with uh, us moving more into the privacy first, um, first uh, uh, world, we really need to focus more on the holistic measurement, like and using multi-touch attribution and media mix modeling, just really to see how each of the channel and touch point of your media mix uh, is contributing, is working uh, together so you can make uh, uh, more like correct and insightful decision and also leverage a lot of uh, incrementality solutions uh, and uh, tools, including uh, geo lift studies, uh, um, conversion lift uh, studies, uh, uh, and like post purchase uh, service. So, really, because we are a bit like losing this direct links, it will be more difficult for us to actually to track the direct uh, journey to conversion. That's why we need a bit like to have got more like a helicopter view of uh, how all our channels are working in combination, in collaboration together. But uh, uh, like probably like I would say like combine uh, like uh, um, attribution, uh, combine incrementality and uh, modeling uh, uh, solutions uh, to together in order to have got like really big, uh, like a holistic view of the success. Agreed. I think to wrap it up um, and build on all those points. Um, so yes, as, as mentioned, viewability, I think is a great one. Time and view, um, also invalid traffic. Um, it's a good way to understand if you you know are actually reaching real users. Um, and then kind of similar to what we were talking about with context, um, either measuring contextual relevance or brand safety and suitability. Those are also um, available without the use of cookies and great metrics just to understand um, where your ads were, were appearing um, and understanding, again, that, that brand awareness kind of um, play with it. So I think all those, um, as everyone had mentioned, are, are great um, KPIs that don't use cookies. Great, thank you. And and I can I can almost feel a webinar coming on just about media mix modeling and and how that how that could work. But anyway, that's maybe for another time. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, thank all of you, Ksenia, Elton, Laura, and Justy, for, for taking the time to join us today. And thank you to everyone um, for for jo joining in and. Um, and watching. Um, just before we close, I've just got a couple of other upcoming events to tell you about. Um, so I think it will now appear on the next slide. If we just go to the next one. So we've got um, a webinar all about the uh, transparency and consent framework coming up uh, next week. So it's a real 101 um, deep dive. So if you want to know more about the transparency and consent framework, or you want to your teams to know more about it, then um, please do sign up for that. And then I think there's one more, which is actually tomorrow. So this is a kind of partnership event that we do with um, with SIM, which is the Centre for um, International Media Measurement um, run out of the US. But we're, we're partnering with EACA, EGTA, WFA and SIM on this international knowledge exchange on audience measurement. So I expect lots of discussion around um, what's going to happen after third party cookies. So um, that's tomorrow at uh, four o'clock Europe time. So if you've got um, an hour spare there, feel free to join in. But otherwise, thank you very much to all of our speakers, all of our participants, and um, hopefully see you again soon. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Cheers.